All right, so I freed up a little disk space on my uh, little cell phone here, and I thought it was a wonderful opportunity to begin a uh, another daily ministries video because something just struck my mind. Uh, some of the conceptions and misconceptions, uh, preconceptions of uh, different entities in the Bible, including that of Lucifer and God. Um, in accordance with, you know, some people wonder where things come from. And in particular, you know, the, the, the devil with horns is widely discussed. In fact, there's a rather uh, interesting, yet not all informative documentary called How Did the Devil Get His Horns? And I actually have some idea about that, which I will tell you in the following, uh, uh, which I'll tell you now, which I don't think that documentary quite exactly delved into. But um, basically, in the Bible, horns are symbolic of power, and there is a passage in the book of Revelations in which that, uh, I call it a many-membered beast, because the beast is not an actual beast, but it, it has these different body parts that diff represent different leaders and rulers and movements within the world, you know. Uh, the, the horns, in that case, on the, on the beast, as described in Revelation, it tells you that it is an expression. And it says that the horns come to represent different leaders of the earth, and different kings. And, you know, we no longer officially have kings in some areas of the world, but they, we still have rulers, presidents, and um, prime ministers and so forth. You know, a rose by any other name still smells uh, just as sweet. So that's one thing. And in fact, you know, horns are symbolic of power. And in some depictions of Moses, they even have him growing horns. It is believed to have been one of the disfigurements given to him when he when he saw uh, when he saw God with his own eyes, or a representation of the light with his own eyes, and it is said to have uh, I don't know if it perhaps blinded him, but it it disfigured him in a way. Uh, we we actually think of when I say we, I mean myself and Shepherd's Chapel, where I give this information. My pastor thinks that Moses received like a glow over his body but from then on afterwards he covered himself in a, sh in a like a shroud over his face uh, to uh, hide the uh, the prominence of his I, I, you know I call it a disfigurement but all to us it might even be something like wow he glows in the dark or something but something happened to him uh, with his communication with the burning bush and you know when he uh, stood face to face with, uh, with with God, you know, the presence of God, and however he manifested himself to Moses. So that, that, there's a few things. Uh, another thing is how exactly did, you know, I was discussing this with my friend Jeff, uh, you know, little ways into the night when we were watching movies and stuff, and he was, I think one of, I think he may have asked the question of uh, how exactly did the, did the ram uh, or the goat get affiliated with Satan. And there's a few, uh, you can look it up. For, for one thing, you can look it up from the people who worship Satan, which aren't always exactly right, but they do have a reason of why, you know, Lucifer is depicted as a goat. Uh, but another reason is, like it says, as I described earlier, horns are symbolic of power. And I also believe that if, uh, if Christ represents himself to be, you know, the lamb, more or less, then they probably want to represent themselves to be the goat because they want to, you know, it just kind of be like a more aggressive, or uh, maybe I'm kind of getting wrong here because because God himself is aggressive. God, you know, hands out the punishments. But Lucifer wants to dethrone God and take his place. So, you know, Lucifer doesn't like to be depicted as weak. Also, the horns are featured on a, a number of deities. You know, it's, it's um, kind of like... Um, uh, Balaam is, is someone uh, is, is something I learned about last night. Actually, I knew about Balaam for a long time, but I never knew fully knew how he was represented until now. And apparently, in his case, he's de often depicted as a bull, often similar to another deity by the name of Molech. And both of them are Canaanite deities. Uh, the the Canaanites, not not Canaanites, Canaanites, Canaanites who are descended from uh, one of the sons of Noah. I think he was maybe the third son of Noah. I don't know precisely in what order. That's why I didn't say the third son of Noah. But the Canaanites uh, went on to become the Phoenicians and in what is now called uh, modern-day Lebanon. And I was watching a documentary on them last night where they were questioning whether or not they had human sacrifices, which I believe are, are 
are detailed in the Bible. You know, I think it, 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 it describes them sacrificing children before Molech, if not Baal. And I think they also so sacrificed children to Baal. And that might be mentioned in the Bible. They, what they were trying to do with the documentary is discuss the possibility of whether the Phoenicians had gotten a bad rap from the Romans, who were their enemies at the time. And of course, uh, Hannibal was the great Phoenician leader that invaded Rome with a herd of elephants. And a lot of people, because his history is so often told from the Roman side, uh, but Hannibal is so well respected because of what he almost did in, in the seizing of Rome. Uh, then people want to rethink what they think about with the Phoenicians and say, well, this great general came from came uh, Phoenicia or whatever, uh, Lebanon or what, you know, and uh, maybe he ain't so bad if he's such an intelligent, bright general. Well, you know, intelligence is not morality. You know, you can be a, a bright and, you know, wise thinking general and still come from the worst piles of crap you know, imaginable. So uh, Hannibal was the one-eyed general who invaded Carthage. Interestingly enough, I do think that uh, the Norse deity of Odin may or may not have been, well, that's a little vague, may have been inspired by Hannibal given the fact of the one eye and of him being a war god, you know, which also his son Thor is also kind of like a war god. And uh, teachings of Thor even, even get mixed up with Christianity and in some ways you can almost, they almost make Thor into Jesus and there's an interesting way in which you know, the, the Vikings converted into Christians as did the Romans. And when they converted into Christians, they still kept some of their stuff, like their symbolic stuff, almost like a football team. And they, they may or may not have blended it into the religion. You can't really blend Norse mythology into Christianity, though, as long as you are a Bible-reading Christian. So a lot of these things I was told by my teachers when I was a kid, uh, uh, not teachers, might have been books or whatever. The anthropologists tell a distinctly different story than what is fact uh, because they tiptoe around the fact that, you know, like I said, the Vikings converted to Christianity, the Romans converted to Christianity, uh, the, 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 the Roman Empire didn't necessarily fall as much as it became converted and it, became, and it turned into different countries. So, you know, like, uh, you know, and then the, the Vikings, like I said, they civilized and reorganized themselves so they were less violent and barbaric. And, you know, they may have kept, you know, a few of their stuff, like, you know, just interesting statues and stuff, but they became full-on Christians. And even even now, as, you know, let's say the rest of the world uh, gets rid of, the, it gets rid of uh, tries to cast off God, uh, there's still something very unique and wholesome about the Scandinavians, where they're just very good people that take care of each other and, you know, have a very low crime rate. Uh, so, you know, like, say, a thousand years... Uh, after the Vikings, I don't know if it's been a thousand years since the Vikings, but you know, a couple hundred years to a thousand years after the Vikings, those are some of the most civilized men on the earth. Whereas back in the old days, they were, you know, torturing and murdering monks and, you know, killing whoever they wanted to do. But expert navigators, they sailed, uh, they sailed every ocean available, every body of water available to them. And they were uh, some of the early uh, discoverers of, uh, of America. You know, it's interesting that, you know, uh, technically, it's interesting that technically, uh, uh, technically, making a turn, I gotta be careful here. Technically, Christopher Columbus uh, discovered, he landed in somewhere around Cuba and where it called the West Indies or Jamaica and, and so forth. That's what, the, that's what Jamaica used to be called was the West Indies. And um, a lot of other um, people had reached America before him, including the Vikings. Now the Vikings under Leif Erikson uh, discovered America. Um, he, found, he came into Newfoundland, like somewhere around Canada and was supposedly driven off by the Indians, but there's some evidence that they, that may not be true. I'm running out of time here, so I may have to cut the video short. And then um, other groups of people were supposed to have came to America even before him, but no one colonized America until the, uh, the Pilgrims, 